saint. And Jesus is the greatest thing to ever live. Jesus is everything I've ever needed. Jesus is true. Jesus is not just a good guy. Jesus is like... Jesus is why I'm still alive. Jesus is my home. Jesus is my hope. Jesus is love. Jesus is someone that is human, just like the rest of us. Jesus is pretty darn influential. Jesus is Jesus. My name is Mark Rossi. I'm the, one of the elders here at Severn, giving Ryan a break as he prepares for this week and delivering a message on Good Friday and then on Easter Sunday. If you're visiting us here today for the first time, welcome. We're blessed, really blessed, that you've chosen to spend an hour or two with us this morning. Today, I have the privilege of sharing God's Word with you as we prepare to bring to an end this series that we've been calling Jesus Is. And we'll end that with both our Good Friday and our Easter celebrations. As Aaron mentioned to you, we're going to have a Good Friday celebration here, a service on this Friday. Yes, Easter is upon us. It's going to be a really special time. Good Friday is a really solemn time when we can reflect on the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross, leading up to the cross. And then following that on Sunday, we'll celebrate his resurrection. So come, bring a friend. You know, it's, um, it's well known that people are most open to coming to churches two times of the year. That's Christmas and Easter. So it's upon us. Bring a friend, bring a neighbor, bring a coworker, bring somebody within your circle of influence because I guarantee you, they're going to hear the, pre the gospel of Jesus Christ preached here at Severn Covenant Church. You bring them, Ryan will scoop them up, and, and uh, they'll become part of the family. So, following the Easter service, Ryan's going to kick off a brand new series from the book of Acts. And he's going to call it The Roots. Really cool. It's from the book of Acts. It's really important that we understand where we came from so that we can know where we're going. I'm really excited. It's going to be a long series. It's going to be a great series. So again, tell your friends about it. We're going to do some great things here. So spring is here. At least the calendar says that spring is here. Right, the equinox has passed, there's more daylight than there's darkness. It did get above 50 one time last week, right? <laughs> it certainly didn't feel like that yesterday. It was down to 20-some degrees. But it is here. At least the snow and the ice is completely melted, right? Amen? It's supposed to be here. And I think I even saw some flurries yesterday. So... I don't know. God has it all in control. But, though the ice and snow has melted, I bet you if you look around with all the storms that we seem to have and the wind and so forth, this season left many of our yards in quite a bit of disarray. I don't know if you're blessed like I am to have trees in your yard and trees on the side of your yard and trees behind your yards you probably have sticks and fallen branches and dead leaves all over the place you know when patty and i got married um we live in a little tiny house actually before we were married i bought this house i always wanted to live on the water and i found this little shack it basically was four rooms on cement pie lines that that was on this little narrow lot it was only 50 feet wide but it was mine and I rebuilt it, and then we got married, and she moved in. The neat thing about it is the lot was small, and I didn't have any of those problems. I didn't have any trees. I didn't have any sticks that fell. It was really easy to clean up. But then, as our family got bigger and my mom came to live with us, we decided to get a bigger house and a bigger lot. And it's almost two acres big. I and it's completely surrounded by trees. 
I have no idea what I was thinking and why I did this, why I thought I wanted this much land. But yes, I have it. And you know, too, if you have gardens, you probably need to prune them. You've got bushes. They need to be cut. You've got flower beds that need to be weeded. Because there's some pesky weeds, though, the winter's supposed to kill them, that just seem to hold on throughout the winter. And, you know, you've got to mulch those flower beds if you want those flowers to grow and to not be overtaken by the weeds of the summer. So it can be a labor of love, but mostly it's just hard work, right? But if you want your yard to look nice this summer, when you have those cookouts and friends over, you need to invest a little bit of time and a little bit of tender, loving care this spring, whenever it really comes. <coughs> Leading up to Easter, we've been in this series that we call Jesus Is. In that series, we focused on the seven I Am statements that you can find that Jesus said about himself in the Gospel of John. Um, each of the I Am statements recorded in the, the, book of, uh, in the Gospel of John pointed to the deity of Christ. Each one a metaphor, a metaphor that elevated Jesus to the level of creator, to the level of sustainer, to savior, to Lord. Titles that can only be claimed by God himself. So such as Jesus said, I am the light of the world, where Jesus is the means that pierced the darkness of our spiritual bondage. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the door. By saying this, Jesus is proclaiming that Jesus is the only way, the only means to salvation. Pretty exclusive claim, don't you think? Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. He's the one who knows and cares and protects those that have been given to him by the Father, even with his life. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. I think I'll leave that one for next Sunday. And finally, the last I am statement is the one that I want to focus on today. And that was Jesus said, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. We find this as we come to the chapters in the Gospel of John. It's in chapter 15 where uh, uh, the text is leading up to the death of Christ. Just, you can see it, Jesus prepares and comforts his disciples. They're sitting in the upper room. It's the last supper as we've come to know it. And he's about to reveal to his disciples what's going to happen that very night as Judas betrays him, as he's taken by the, the Jewish leaders of the time and handed over to the Romans. The very creator of the universe was about to subject himself to his own creation on our behalf. So he prepares them. He comforts them. And right before he makes this last statement, he reassures his disciples that though he's going to leave, though he's not going to be with them anymore as he had been with them for the past three years, that he's never, ever going to leave them high and dry. As a matter of fact, he assures them that he's going to send the comforter the paraclete, as it's known in Greek, the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is going to live and to dwell inside each and every one of his disciples and in everyone who is a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Imagine for a minute what it must have been like that night. Just think about it. In the upper room, Jesus had just washed their feet a sign of his servanthood. He broke bread with them and he shared the wine with them. He told them that he would be handed over to die. After Judas had left to do what no one in the room understood he was about to do but Jesus. After he was gone, there were 11 left and he shares with them his final words of instruction after three long years of ministry and discipleship. I'm sure the silence was deafening. The remaining disciples hanging on each and every one of his last words. Can you picture it? Can you be there 
Move yourself there. Knowing how distraught and knowing how alone that they would feel after he was gone, Jesus tells his disciples this one last metaphor that he wants them to remember as he encourages them. So I'm reading from John's Gospel, chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Jesus says, it's in red text, says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory, and that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands... You will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity to open your word, to prepare our hearts to hear it, to ponder and contemplate as this week approaches the depth, the depth of of the sacrifice that you made on my behalf. Thank you, Lord, that we live in a country where week after week we can stand here and preach your word boldly and unashamedly. I pray we'd never take that for granted. And Lord, I pray that your word would go forth to to everyone who would hear that they may know you are God that they may believe that you saved them and paid the price for them on that cross, that they would understand that by your resurrection, we too can have eternal life with you forever. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Before we begin to dig deeply into the meaning of this metaphor, we need to understand a little bit about grapes and the vines they grow on. Last week, Ryan uh, 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 talked about how he had to study about sheep to talk about I am the good shepherd. I had to study a little bit about grape farming. Now, granted, grapes aren't as special. They're not as dumb and they're not as dirty and they're certainly not as helpless as sheep. But, you know, they really were important culturally and economically and they were very relevant in Bible times. Grapes were a great source of sustenance, right? While they were growing fresh, people ate them raw. When they were, they would dry them up as raisins and, and store them for the winter months. They would squeeze them to pour forth the juice that would be used to make wine, uh, 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 to, to drink, and vinegar to preserve, right? They used that, the vinegar to preserve vegetables. You know, Vlasic did not invent the pickle. <laughs> Even back then, they used vinegar to preserve. You know, I, can, I actually have a personal experience with, with vines. When I was a very young child, very young, like under eight, my grandfather had a yard, a backyard. It wasn't a big yard, but it was, a, it was to me, at eight years old, it looked big. And way in the back corner of the yard was a grapevine. It was one of those kinds that was on a trellis, and the The big woody vines grew up and you saw all the grape leaves on top and the grapes hanging down and they were big. I just remember them being big purple grapes. And I remember when it was time to harvest, he would pick me and my older sister up and he'd put put us up on his shoulders as we reached up and helped to pull down those grapes. It was really a fond memory. And he had this big metal 
vat or bucket or whatever you'd call it, and he'd put those grapes in. And then he'd take my sister and I and he'd wash our feet. And he'd put us in that vat and we would stomp those grapes to squeeze out all the juice. And he'd pour it through a strainer into bottles and, you know, he made it into wine and whatever else he did. Well, a grape is a vine that's very woody from its root. And then it grows up and it becomes more fleshy and it fills with leaves and it fills with grapes. Uncultivated, though, left uncultivated, it'll get very wild and produce very little to no fruit, if anything, just little wild grapes. In Palestine, where Jesus lived and he taught, vineyards were everywhere. They were a very common sight. You could not walk that area without seeing vines. Typically, they were on the side of a hill because they didn't really require the most fertile soil. They could grow in rocky soil. Now, the farmer had to clear the really big rocks that are common on the hillsides in, in Palestine and in Israel. But he left the little ones because they were made of limestone and they actually helped sweeten the soil. And he would clear out an area. He would flatten it. He would take and build a, a, a hedge or a fence around his, his vineyard to protect it from predators who would come in and, and eat the grapes or even from thieves who would steal them. And right smack dab in the middle of the vineyard you could see a watchtower he would build a watchtower so that he could uh, uh, stand there and watch over his entire vineyard and and protect it and 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 guard it because it was his lifeblood it was the source of his income it was the source of life for him now <clears throat> the farmer though didn't spend all of his time up in that in that watchtower because growing grapes takes an awful lot of work. Grapes need to be trained, and they need to be pruned, and they need to be the, the, the dead wood cut out so that the grapes will grow, the leaves will be removed so more sun can get to the, the clusters of grapes. So after he planted the choicest of vines, he would dress those vines so that the fruit was plentiful. The metaphor and the symbolism of the vine of the branches used here by Jesus was not lost on his disciples. So they would have been familiar with it. But in addition, this metaphor was used throughout all of the Old Testament, right? It was talked about by the, by the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah and Hosea. It was found in the Psalms. Go read Psalm 80. But in those references, the vine was Israel, God the vine dresser. And though the vine flourished in the beginning and produced much fruit, eventually Israel turned from God. Eventually Israel allowed itself to grow wild and the fruit became less and less. As they turned to other gods, as they turned and worshipped idols of the neighboring lands, the vine no longer produced fruit. But Jesus was not talking about Israel here. Jesus, which, which brings me to my first point, if we have the, the slide. Jesus, as the true vine, is the only source of life. This source of life, this righteousness that Jesus teaches here does not come by belonging to a race. It doesn't come <clears throat> by adhering to a law or by doing good works, which we know, which he tells us, can never save. The Apostle Paul in Romans tells us that none is righteous. No, not one. That's me. That's all of you. We've all fallen. We've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. If you think I'm describing you, you're in good company. We're all the same way because righteousness cannot be earned. Righteousness will never come from anything we will do. We can never be good enough to earn God's favor. But there is one who has done that on our behalf. The Bible tells us that righteousness comes by the grace of God, through faith in the one 
that led the perfect sinless life. The one who allowed his creation to nail him to a tree that he created and died so that we may live. Jesus said here, I, in this last I am statement, that he is the source of all life. We know he said he's the door. We know he said he's the good shepherd. We know he said he's the way, the truth, and the life. And here he's saying, I am the source of your life. It was, Jesus is saying here, it was never about religion. It's always been about a relationship. It's always been about a relationship with me. And through his blood, this connection, or through this bond, this connection to the very source of life, through this bond, we can enjoy peace with God. We can enjoy peace at the hands of the vine dresser, God the Father, the one who made us, the one who called us by name, the one who grafted us in to his vine, so to speak, from the very beginning, from the foundations of the earth. And that brings, us to my, brings me to my second point. And that is, while Jesus is the vine, mankind makes up the branches, right? Branches on a grapevine come in two kinds. They are either fruit-bearing or they're barren. There's no other way. There's either fruit or there's no fruit. It's obvious from Scripture that fruit-bearing uh, branches represent true Christians, believers in Christ, the grace through, through faith thing that I talked about. But the identity of the fruitless ones has been a subject of much debate. Either the barren branches are believers who have turned away and bear no spiritual fruit, or they were never really believers in the first place. Think about it. I bet you've thought of this in both ways in the past. To answer the debate, though, I think that we need to look within the context of this I am statement right there in the Gospel of John. Remember, the disciples were with Jesus that last night. He had served them. He'd washed their feet. He had loved on them. He had comforted them. He, and, and, and his thoughts, no doubt, were with his father, as they would be when he got to the garden at Gethsemane. But he was also thinking about the events and the pain and the suffering. But he had one other thing on his mind. There was someone else he was worried about, someone else that he, he grieved over. Among the 12 disciples was Judas Iscariot. For those of you who don't know, Judas was the one disciple that eventually left the fold and be betrayed Jesus with a kiss in the Garden of Gethsemane that identified Jesus to, to the uh, priests and the, and the uh, ruling authorities who Jesus was in the dark of the night. So after Judas had left them that night to meet up with those Jewish authorities, Jesus continued to comfort the remaining 11 disciples. And in an attempt to explain what was going to happen, as Jesus betrays him, because they wouldn't have understood this. Remember, Jesus was with them the whole time. He ate with them. He slept with them. He lived with them. He was the one that was the caretaker of the money, that what little they had. In an attempt to explain what's going to happen, Jesus gives them this last metaphor. The fruit-bearing branches represent the 11, all the true disciples of Jesus. And the fruitless branches represent Judas and all those who were never truly disciples. So you might say, how, how do you know that? Okay, that's an opinion. How do you know that? Well, look back at chapter 13, verses uh, 10 through, uh, uh, and, and 10 and on. After Jesus is washing his, the disciples' feet, he says, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. The whole body's clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew, he would betray, he knew who would betray him. And that is why he said, not every one of you was clean. 
So Jesus already told them what he was saying here, that once a person receives forgiveness of God, he's clean. He's clean. And he's clean once and for all. He doesn't need to get back into the bathing of forgiveness ever again. All we need to do, all we need to do every single day is to clean off the dust and the dirt of the sins of, of, of the day. But salvation is once and for all. Once and for all. But if you've never been bathed, if you've never been clean, washing feet does no good. We are saved by grace through faith, by the hearing of the word and believing in Jesus. And as a result, as a result, if you are a believer in Christ, you will bear much fruit. If there is no fruit, if there is no fruit, then you need to examine yourself carefully to see if you are in the faith. To quote a, a famous Severn, Maryland preacher, that's it. That's all. It couldn't be simpler. And I'm not done. Don't clap yet. <laughs> I've only gotten to two points, so how could I possibly be done? But it does bring me to my third point this morning. A true believer connected to the true vine will never perish. When a believer sins again and again, and we all do, I know I'm talking to the same crowd. I bet it happened today. I bet it'll happen this afternoon. And I guarantee you it'll happen tomorrow. When we sin, as children of God, we don't need to be saved again. We just need to restore our right relationship with Jesus. All that is necessary is for us to clean the dust and dirt of our daily lives off of our feet. Even though Jesus washed the feet of Judas, he knew Judas had not been bathed and he was not a child of God. And that is why he said, not all of you are clean. Judas appeared to be like the other disciples. He looked like them. He looked just like the other branches of the vine before the fruit budded, but he never bore real fruit. And as a result, God, the Father, the vine dresser finally removed that branch from the vine and it was burned with all those who were rejected. Some may argue, well then how do you know that Judas didn't just lose his salvation? I think scripture is very clear on that point and, and, and Ryan brought that up last week. When he read about the good shepherd, Jesus said, my sheep listen to my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one, no one and nothing can snatch them out of my hand. Here's the good news for believers. The good news is your salvation is secure. It's secure. True believers connected to the true vine, the source of eternal life, secure in our salvation. We are secure. And as a result, the scripture tells us that our joy, our joy is made complete. What more could we want? What more could we hope for? The answer to that question, the answer to that question can be found in my fourth point this morning. And that is a true believer connected to the true vine. When pruned will bear abundant fruit. Key words, when pruned will bear abundant fruit. It's not a point of whether you will bear fruit, but if you allow the pruning process, not only will you bear fruit, but you will bear it abundantly as true followers of jesus our goal should not stop with our salvation salvation is a one-time event 
justification, regeneration. It's a gavel that God slams down on the podium and says, thou art saved. Not because of anything that you have done, not because of anything that you could possibly do, but because of what my son did on your behalf. A one-time event, we are righteous. We are holy. And when we stand on the last day before a holy and righteous God, he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant, not because of anything we earned, not because of any work that we did, because he will see the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed, as we say, put on us as a result of the finished work of Jesus Christ. We shouldn't stop with salvation. Our goal has to be to bear much fruit for the kingdom. And why do we want to do that? Why is, do we do anything in this life? To bring glory to God. We bring glory to God, and while we are here, his command for us is to go into our sphere of influence, to go into Severn, to go into Glen Burnie, to go into Pasadena and Fort Meade and Judea, Samaria, and the outer ends of the world to make disciples of Jesus Christ until all are gathered, all are gathered. But also our deepest desires should be to fulfill the glory of of the Father. We do it because he told us to do it. We do it because he wants us to do it. We do it because it brings the lover of our souls glory. And those desires, those deep desires to be fulfilled, those deepest desires will not come from our flesh, but they'll spring up from a desire to be known as a disciple of Jesus. We all know what our flesh can desire. But as we become more and more like Jesus, our desires for fleshly things are replaced with a desire to be known as a disciple of Jesus, the source of our very life, the author of that desire. But to achieve this, purity of desire we must be pruned the bible says pruned by the fire father by the vine dresser who prunes every branch that does bear fruit he's already gotten rid of the ones that don't bear fruit but if you bear fruit he says he must prune them so that every branch that does bear fruit will be even more fruitful how did he do that Sometimes the shoots come up and they'll actually nip them so that they don't grow too fast. Have we ever gotten ahead of God? Sometimes the vines want to grow so fast and long they get scraggly and they get away from the source of life and they have to be cut off. Sometimes they're clouded with a bunch of leaves that want to suck the life out of the vine instead of pouring it into the fruit. That's the pruning process. That's the pruning process. But ouch, we don't like that, do we? We don't like the fact that we've got to be pruned. We like the part about fulfilling the deepest desires, but who likes to be pruned? Remember those yards and gardens back home? They're still waiting for you. The sun is going to come out tomorrow. I won't sing it. <laughs> They're not going to be cleaned and weeded and pruned and they're not going to mulch themselves. If you, take, if you care for them and you want them to look their best, you're going to have to do some work. You're going to have to get some skin in the game. You're going to have to get on your knees. You're going to have to prune and shape and mulch those gardens. For the vine dresser, for the vine dresser, his work never ends. During the summer, those little shoots want to go all over the place all the time. The more sun there is, the more rain there is, the more work there is to do. It's not a one-time event. You don't say, I got my pruning, I'm done for life. No. It's a lifetime event. <clears throat> Ever feel like 
God cuts you down just when you think you've, you're finally getting ahead? When that happens, did you perhaps think that maybe, just maybe, you were getting ahead of his plan? That he wasn't cutting you back, but he was holding you back so that you would be ready for what he's about to do. Perhaps <clears throat> you've left sometimes wondering why, why do bad things happen to good people? Why is it that bad things happen to good people? You know, I want to tell you something. A lot of bad preaching has been around that. I'm going to tell you we live in a fallen world. We live as a result of the fall. When Adam sinned in the garden, disease and pestilence and weeds and ticks and all kinds of things came into this world. In many cases, our circumstances are a direct result of the fall. But if not, perhaps God is pruning you. Perhaps God is molding you and shaping you so that you can bear much fruit for him. Sometimes he uses that vine dresser's knife. That knife just cuts things out that prevent us from growing and blossoming. Those things that block out the sun and rob the life-giving nourishment that comes from the true vine, from Jesus Christ. Things that we put in, in God's place, things that draw our attention, things that draw our desire. He wants to cut those out so that we can connect to the real source of our life. And sometimes that cutting comes in various forms. We are well aware of them. Sometimes it comes in the form of sickness. Sometimes it comes in the form of hardship or, or loss of a job or, or grief for a time, for a time. What Olympic athlete wins a gold medal without significant discipline and great personal sacrifice? What bodybuilder develops his muscles without first experiencing the pain of tearing and rebuilding? Whatever method God is using to prune us, to mold us, to shape us, be assured, be assured that his ultimate desire in that pruning is for our good because he loves us, because he cares for us, because he stands in the watchtower all night and guards us, because he keeps us from those predators who would destroy us, and those thieves who would try to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. Because he wants us to be fruitful to his glory. And he wants us to develop into the man or the woman of God that before the foundations of the earth were laid, he has called us to be. He wants us to be free from those fruitless branches that suck the life out of us. You know what I'm talking about. Those, those, those lifeless branches, those fruitless branches, they suck the life out of us and they leave us weak and ineffective and diluted in our efforts. If we remember that God is trying to make us more fruitful, we can look past that pruning process as he shapes us and, and, and fulfills his calling on our life. And just as we're called as parents, those of you who have kids, to, to mold and shape and prune the lives of our children, God does the same as he molds and shapes us into the very image of his son with the goal of making us holy and blameless in his sight. I know we don't feel most times holy and blameless in his sight, but that is his goal because he sees us through the eyes of his son. This is the process. It's a big word. It's called sanctification. But it's not a one-time event, just like the pruning. Sanctification is a lifelong process. And as we go through the pruning process of life, as we are sanctified, keep in mind it's for our good that Jesus does it. And that we will overcome it. We will overcome the pain of the pruning process 
as we strive every single day to become more and more like Jesus. Jesus, who is the source of our strength and hope. Jesus, who is the true vine, the only source of life. You will not find life in any other source. Jesus, who, who or, or God the Father, who prunes the dead branches away that we may have life that the branches that bear fruit are you and me, are believers in Jesus Christ. That we may have abundant fruit. That we may have abundant fruit and do all that God has called us to do in this life for his glory. Are you ready to be pruned? Are you ready to get out the rakes and the shovels and the trash bags and pick up the debris in our lives? as we become more and more like Jesus. Jesus said, I am the true vine. I'm not that one that we talked about in the Old Testament, Israel. I'm the true vine. I'm the source of life. And all you need is me. Amen? Amen.